So in a few seconds, we're gonna start. Um, so I'm going back to the presentation. Okay, so we're good to go. So thank you again, everyone for arriving. Today, we're gonna to talk about hiring and managing remote teams a big topic, especially in 2020, but it was also big before, honestly, uh, only becoming more and more big with time. And uh, I do want to say that this for this presentation, I have a feeling that we're going to focus a lot more on the hiring part. There is a lot to know there, uh, and it's going to be very difficult in an hour to get, teach you all the secrets of hiring and managing. Uh, we will probably do another uh, lecture about managing, but feel free. Uh, to ask questions about uh, managing as well. Uh, if you need to, this is my email, that's our Twitter. Uh, my name is Ali David, I'm the CEO of Startup Link. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Startup Link. What we're gonna do today is um, I'm gonna uh, share a little bit of my experience uh, from, uh, uh, you know, about myself, about, uh, about uh, my career, uh, a little bit about my freelancing uh, career as well, to kind of like give you a little bit of taste of how it feels like to be hired by people. Uh, we're also going to do a general discussion uh, about uh, remote hiring after I give you the intro. And then if we're going to have time, uh, hopefully we can reach the part about uh, managing uh, remote teams as well. Okay, so um, let's start with a little bit of introduction about my lifestyle. And that connects really to the, to the topic of hiring and um, hiring remotely and managing remotely. So basically what I'm doing in the last 10, year, 10 years, uh, actually it's gonna be 10 years in one month, uh, I'm living a digital nomad lifestyle, which means that I'm moving between locations uh, constantly, uh, spending about two months in each place before I move to the other place, which means that uh, in this period I lived in more than 40 countries. Uh, now, by the way, uh, in Saloniki in Greece, and my next stop is actually in Canary Islands, uh, in about a week. So keep on moving with the seasons more than anything. Uh, I do want to say that I have a blog and podcast about the topic of, um, uh, let's say, uh, digital nomadism, moving between locations, long-term travel at becomenomad.com. So feel free to check it later. I will tell you the following. Hiring and managing remotely allows you to have a location-independent lifestyle. This is one of the most beautiful things that have to do uh, with, the, with the, the remote work. Basically, uh, instead of commuting, going to the office every day, you can now take hold of your lifestyle, do whatever you want and disconnect from your location uh, as a source of revenue. And this is absolutely a, a game changer, which I understood 10 years ago. Many people understand this now. Um, so if you work wisely here, uh, either working or hiring, you can really increase your degrees of uh, freedom in a way in your own personal life. So that's uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, this lecture focuses a little bit about my experience from a few things that I've done. Uh, one of them is uh, freelancing and preparing business plans for about four years on Upwork. It used to be Elance back then. Uh, so it's something that I've learned how, how to be hired, which is also important uh, now. Um, it also focuses on a few of my experiences in Become Nomad in this blog and podcast that I told you about. Um, I also had an online language school uh, called LingoLearn, which I'm still a little bit involved in, but not, not, not really in the operations as an investor. Uh, and this thing actually generated uh, a situation that we hired dozens and dozens of teachers to teach languages on one-on-one -on -one or gr group uh, lessons. And uh, it also uh, has to do with my current uh, position as CEO in uh, startuplink.com, which is a tech startup. We have a team of uh, 10 people that are working uh, full time. So uh, there's been a lot of transition uh, basically during my career and uh, especially in, in, in the sense of hiring, being hired and so on. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, I can share some of the lessons uh, with you. Um, so yeah, about, uh, about uh, Startup Link, uh, just as a side note, if you don't know it, basically we have a global startup ecosystem map at startuplink.com. 
Uh, there are tens of thousands of startups, co-working spaces, accelerators. Basically, it's the place that we intended to be the best place to understand uh, the quality and the momentum of startup ecosystems. Just as a, as a side note, we're working uh, basically with a few global data partners like Crunchbase and SEMrush and meetup.com, where most of our communities are and a lot of you arrive via meetup and Coworker, a great uh, location for uh, a great uh, directory for co-working. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what we usually do, which would probably not be relevant for you, but uh, I'll still let you know a little bit about what's our business model. Basically, what we do is work more than anything with the public sector, with governments, municipalities, economic development corporations. Uh, what we do for them is uh, helping them to map their startup ecosystem using our technology, promote their startup ecosystem, because startup ecosystems for us are actually a product, and grow their startup ecosystem with consulting. Uh, startup Link is also deploying uh, maps for uh, private sector clients. So for example, whoever wants a map about FinTech or, or about uh, AI or a regional map or a map of Ukrainian founders around the world, uh, we're deploying those, uh, those maps uh, uh, as well. And uh, before we start uh, talking about hiring, I have only one thing that I want to sell to you. And this is basically the idea of what we're doing. And I'll let you know that basically our core mission and vision is to uncover the truth about ecosystems and encourage you, regardless of who you are, to uh, uh, always improve your position in sense of are you in the right place? Uh, so Startup Link, one of the things that we're doing other than mapping ecosystems is also ranking the startup ecosystems of 1,000 cities and 100 countries. It's something that uh, we really enjoy doing and you can see it uh, below the map if you go to startuplink.com. The idea over here is, and we provide all of this for free, including a free report. The idea over here is that we always encourage entrepreneurs and uh, business owners or even people that are freelancing or remote workers to go to a thriving place that has a good startup ecosystem. The reason is that where you are actually matters a lot. Uh, there is a reason why most of the unicorns and the big startups in the world are only in a few locations. There is a beautiful network effect in those locations and the uh, hubs, startup hubs are giving you access to investors, to high quality clients, to great co-founders, with like-minded, uh, let's say, uh, mentality, team members, suppliers, knowledge base. We're going to talk also about hiring remotely. I'm going to talk about uh, actually one of the biggest hacks of hiring remotely is meeting the people in person. Then they can work for you remotely. But uh, uh, there are a few things that if you're in the right place, it will allow you to tap into a variety of sources. And um, so that's uh, something that we're always uh, trying to encourage. Uh, the idea is that if you're in an underperforming ecosystem, uh, we think that you should either uh, leave it and go to a better ecosystem uh, or lead it and take a more active role in the development of your ecosystem. Uh, so what we are basically saying, think very carefully if you're in the right place uh, because uh, this place will greatly influence your chances of success. Some of the resources that we have here on the links, uh, startuplink.com, that's where you can register your startup or co-working or accelerator and also influence the ranking of your city and country next year. Um, we have a free report at report.startuplink.com if you're interested to dive deep into the topic. And by the way, if you go to startuplink.com, uh, this weird link, or just scroll below the map, you would have the full ranking uh, tables uh, of basically 1,000 cities, 100 countries. I encourage everyone to do this thought exercise and try to understand if in, they're in the right place. And you can easily do it on those tables that you see over here that are on startuplink.com below the map. Okay, so now that we, uh, we covered those topics and the bureaucracy and administration, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, hiring. Once again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them, but preferably do that with the QA uh, Q&A button uh, in the in, so I can I can actually see it. So let's talk a little bit about why is hiring so important? Because a lot of us 
have a resistance to hiring people. And I'm going to try to convince you that hiring people is going to be critical to your chances of success as a business. So first of all, sometimes it's a must. Let's say if you don't have the technical skill to build a website or to do accounting uh, or to uh, build contracts and so on and so on, uh, there is no other option than actually hiring someone that does. In this case, an expert, right? Because there are some skills, or there are some things in our business that we cannot do on our own. And I have to tell you, if you're doing more things, uh, every business has a few layers, marketing, sales, uh, client service, uh, development, uh, legal, accounting, and many, many other databases, whatever you can think of. There are basically about 20 or 30 pillars of, of a business. The more you're doing things by yourself, the less you're focusing on the unique thing that you can offer to the world. This is important to remember. Um, so I'm hoping uh, it's understood. Uh, so the idea is that, uh, first of all, why hire? Because sometimes it's a must. Uh, most of us are actually falling in the place where it's not a must, because if it's not a must, we're probably going to do it ourselves. And that's probably the, the biggest tragedy, one of the biggest tragedies of uh, entrepreneurship. Now, one more reason to hire is that it allows you to grow uh, by working on your business and not in your business. This is a, a, there's a very interesting book by, by Michael Gerber uh, calling, uh, uh, I think it's called Emmy Factor. And uh, in this book is talking about the concept that you as a, as a boss uh, of a business, you actually have to work on your business and not in your business. Because he's basically saying that if you're working in your business, doing the work, being busy, 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 uh, you're actually working for the worst, worst boss in the world, which is you, in a way. So the idea is that he is encouraging people to work on their business. I can't agree more. Uh, your business will grow only if you disconnect yourself from the operations of the business. And that's important to remember. Uh, one more reason of why uh, you would like to hire is that it creates the ability to scale your business. There is a very short distance that you can go on your own. Um, and I have to say over here with the caveat, some people are going actually long distance on their own. I've met a few people that do not like to hire so much and they're relatively successful, but they're capped. Like uh, they will never really fulfill their business full potential um, because they have not hired. By the way, in some respects, they're right because they care more about their lifestyle. And they, we're also going to talk about a few reasons about why you don't want to hire as well. Uh, but uh, in this sense, do know that if you want your business to be a leader and to gain more and more power and momentum, not hiring is a big disservice to your business. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, another reason why you want to hire is also to disconnect from the horrible equation of your time equals the money that you receive. So by hiring other people and working on your business, you're basically disconnecting this equation of basically being an employee in your business. And that's an important thing. Uh, regard, regarding to remote hiring, uh, you can connect to incredible talent from all over the world for very low cost, especially if you're in a developed country. Let's say if you're in the USA or in West Europe and so on, it's really a no brainer to find high quality talent in places like, uh, um, uh, depending on, on what you're looking for, but in places like Poland or Greece or uh, even uh, uh, India, uh, Kenya, there, there, there is talent basically everywhere. So the idea is that uh, um, if you find those people, they would work at sums that are not even close to minimum wage in, in other countries. So there is a beautiful arbitrage here. And while doing that, you would also help those people to get closer to Western salaries, which is unheard of in their country. So there is a beautiful balancing act here in a way. Um, and one more reason to hire remotely is that you learn to let go and disconnect from your business. Because again, you don't want to be a slave in your own business. You want to be in a situation that things are ticking, even if you're not there. 
that's that's a dream that's that's what defines a, a healthy business so uh, those are a few reasons of why uh, why it's worthwhile to consider hiring people let's talk a little bit about the disadvantage and uh, disadvantages of hiring because uh, you some of us have a lot of resistance to hiring and for a good reason let's talk a little bit about why and maybe try to discuss those disadvantages so hiring and managing and uh, both of them are skills that take years to develop and they're also not exact science what does it mean it means that regardless of how experienced and good you are in hiring um, you would have bad hires um, and that's because people are people you don't know their entire circumstances it's very likely that in some cases um, uh, things would not work out there would be a gap of expectations their life circumstances would change um, and basically it's a bad hire because they they leave relatively fast so those things happen and what can we do they're part of the game now uh, one more uh, disadvantage is the training people takes time so what does it mean? It means that basically when you hire people, if you expect this to be profitable or easy and make your life easier, forget the profitable, let's focus on make your life easier from, from day one, that's not the case. When you hire people, you have to train them. So that means that in the beginning period of hiring a person, not only that you pay more because now you have an extra salary, but you also, it takes more of your time to train those people. Uh, needless to say, you get the dividends uh, in the future. Uh, it is true to say that dealing with people can be difficult. Everyone has emotions, uh, or psychology plays a game, and it kind of adds another layer of complexity to your life. Because in a way, uh, you're now, instead of just managing yourself, you're also leading other people as well. And that's, uh, that should be noted. Some people find it hard to delegate and trust others. I actually think those are the people that have to hire immediately uh, in order to keep their standard of perfect work. So basically, if you're a perfectionist, you're always going to be disappointed from what other people are doing because it's never in your standard. By the way, if you ask people to measure and see what do they prefer, you might be surprised that your standards is actually not the best standard. But for you and for us, for each one of us, what we do is best, right? Because that's what we know. So the idea is that trusting other people and delegating responsibility is very scary, and especially if you're a perfectionist. So that's, uh, that's notable. And one more thing that uh, you should be aware of that you might hire too early. And if you hire too early, it will result in it might it might result in, in wasting money or or some kind of a cash flow crunch in a way. So um, I'm, I'm by the way one of the people that hire way too early because I just love to not to do the work myself. So uh, in a way, uh, 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 you can fall into the, into this trap as well. So uh, something to think about. Once again, if you have any questions, in the meantime, feel free, Q&A button, and uh, we will uh, answer them right away. So um, the big uh, qu one of the biggest questions should be, when should you hire? Based on everything that we talked about now, the advantages, the disadvantages. So one of my answers would be um, right now, but when? Uh, and for $50, uh, if you've never done it before. So regardless of uh, your situation, if you've never hired before, I recommend as a first priority to hire absolutely right now because uh, hiring is a skill and it's a skill that has to be developed. So um, hiring right now makes a lot of sense in case you've never hired before, especially if you limit it for $50 just to gain the skill and just to put a, a, a V let's say, on, uh, on some kind of a, a thing that you've never done before. And once again, it, it makes a lot of sense to do that. So it's a critical skill. Uh, do that right now. If you've never hired before on $50, spend them, you know, on whatever you want, a, a logo, a, a, a new uh, a YouTube video, whatever, just to get there. Now, um, one more uh, timing uh, of hiring is basically uh, when you need to build infrastructure. So let's say you, you need to build your website or you need to design your website. 
you don't have any other option here. If you don't know, if you don't have the technical skill to do that, you need to hire. But that comes to my previous point. If you have experience, even a little bit of experience of hiring someone for $50 or hiring a few people, when you actually need and must hire people for a more serious project, you would have more experience instead of uh, hiring. And that's a mistake that I see a lot of people doing. They have an important project. They did, never hired before because they were scared of it. And then for the first time that they have to hire and they start to understand how to hire people and how to make a good decision, uh, they do that when it's actually important. And that's a mistake. That's why I'm encouraging you to uh, hire right now for $50 if you've never done it before. Now, I will say that if it is possible, try to delay a substantial ongoing commitment. Let's say hiring someone on a salary for $2,000, $3,000 a month, $1,000 a month, until you did a few things. And those things are as following. And I have to say over here, if possible, because if you're doing that for a designer or for a coder, maybe it's, those things are not necessarily possible. The first thing that I recommend is do it yourself. So only hire people after you've done the activity yourself as the CEO of the company. So let's say you wanna hire someone to do sales for you. Don't drop them into the organization and tell them we need to do sales, good luck. Basically be in a situation that you've done, try to do it yourself, you knowing about your business more than anyone else, at least to give them a little bit of guidance about how to sell. The same, the same for marketing and so on. So the idea is that <clears throat> you always want to be in, in, a, in a position that um, you're doing the, a little bit of the work yourself before you're hiring. Let me take a quick water break before uh, I die here. Just like. Okay, so um, first of all, do it yourself. And that's always a good tip. And the second one would be uh, to know how to explain it in, in a clear process. And we talked about this. This is the reason of why you want to do it yourself in the beginning. And the third thing is, and that's important, if you're going into a substantial ongoing commitment, my recommendation would be to make sure that whoever you hire can generate money from this activity. So in a way, let's say if you uh, if you have a, um, let me give an example, you have a startup and your startup actually never made any sales, which means by the way, that you might have a problem with the product market fit. Maybe you're not solving a real pain and so on. If you're hiring someone uh, to do sales for a startup that until now never had sales and you don't have a lot of money, uh, you're kind of shooting yourself in the leg because the idea is that you want to hire hopefully, especially if you don't have a lot of money, when uh, you know that this is something that you can generate money from. So my best case scenario would be in a situation that you did the sales yourself, the sales and the marketing, it actually generated money from the, for the company. And now you hire someone when you have the proof that it actually generates money. So that's important to say. Um, and my advice would be that when you actually did it yourself, when you know how to explain it very well, when there is some kind of documentation for it, and you know that you can generate money from this activity and become profitable, um, deducting the expenses that you pay for this person, then basically always be hiring. Let me repeat this, always be hiring. This is your role as a manager of a company, of a startup, of an agency, whatever you do, always be hiring. Okay, so uh, let's uh, move on to the next slide. Again, if you have any questions about the, the presentation, feel free, there is a QA button. I'll try to, a QA button, I'm gonna try to get to it as uh, between the slides. And let's move on to the next one. So what you see over here is my smiling face uh, as a freelancer. Um, and yeah, basically I'll just tell you that I did business plans for clients for a period of four years mainly in platforms like Upwork, which used to be Elance. Um, so over here, you see an example of how those freelancing platforms look like. Um, and yeah, basically um, you can see that those are the profiles and those are the things that you're gonna see if you go into this platform. So it's good to educate yourself a little bit about, uh, about that. 
And uh, let me tell you a few lessons from the other side of being actually a remote worker uh, myself. So first of all, I want to say that uh, working remotely for clients before you hire makes you better in hiring and managing. Because if you've been on the other side of the table as well, you understand a lot more the psychology of the people that you're working with. So that's uh, kind of like um, uh, something that I uh, recommend to do. Now, um, the mix of hiring and working can be a financial win, especially if you don't have a lot of money currently. What I recommend to people is to work for clients and to hire in the same time. Usually you want to be in a situation that you're the high paid freelancer, let's say, or expert charging a lot for your hours, for, for your project, and you employ people that are lower paid from lower, lower uh, from developing countries, let's say, in, with the lower cost of living, which will allow those people, regardless of their talent, to quote you much lower prices than what you're uh, uh, gaining. And in this way, in a way, you can be in a situation that you sustain your hiring and your business with your own remote work for an employer. So that's kind of like an, an example of something that I've done, that I've developed my startups actually doing exactly that, working for other clients while funneling the money that I got to the clients. That's, uh, that's an interesting one. So um, I will say that also working remotely usually leads to hiring remotely when you scale. So you could be in a situation that, for example, I did business plans, but then I saw that I didn't have enough bandwidth to do it on my own and I started hiring uh, myself for uh, people to help me with the business plan. Uh, the next point would be that some talented people start with absurdly low hourly rate. I wanna say that when I started uh, in my uh, freelancing career, I was actually working for $5 an hour. You could have gotten me uh, full-time for $5 an hour. Uh, and the, the idea is that people, when they start experimenting with remote work, um, they sometimes don't really understand uh, their, their real worth, you know? So in a way, they're kind of like undercutting the prices. Uh, once again, you can get amazing quality of talent for very low, um, uh, let's say, expenditure. So that's something that I've seen with myself when I was offering myself $5 an hour. So uh, uh, pretty interesting when people are freelancing after they leave the job market, they're willing to decrease their pay, especially in the beginning of their remote uh, career. So that's something that I've certainly done uh, and feel happy about it. Um, I do wanna say that also when you work for others, some of them will become your future business partners or suppliers. Uh, uh, Startup Link was actually uh, created uh, by me and my co-founder, uh, uh, Roderick, and Roderick hired me actually for a job. I was freelancing for him. And then after some time, we started Startup Link together. And kind of when I thought about Startup Link and the, the idea kind of came up, uh, then I went to Roderick because we had such a great relationship as a, him as an employer and told him, would you become my co-founder? So um, some good things can happen, even if you work for people as well. Now let's talk a little bit about recommended hiring methods. Uh, and I do want to tell you all that the sources keep on changing. So you don't want to be in a situation that you will only have those sources, but uh, those are the few that are actually with me in the last years and they work relatively well. But every time I'm hiring, I'm changing. I'm changing something, especially in the sources. So a few of the sources that are recommended, upwork.com, a great site. I think it's the biggest marketplace currently in the world for uh, remote work and um, it's recommended, especially if you need freelancers and not full-time people to work for you. Um, Hubstuff, Hubstuff Talent, another great source for uh, finding talent. This one is also free. So unlike Upwork.com, they don't take commission. However, I have to say that the quality and the, uh, let's say, the ability to connect to a lot of freelancers is much more limited because Upwork is much bigger. Uh, Freelancer.com, I never tried it, um, but same same style, marketplace, people per hour, another one, uh, same style. Um, so those are all the job marketplaces in a way. Um, other than that, I would say that uh, uh, there are a few interesting new options. Uh, one of them is LinkedIn. 
So you can actually post jobs currently on LinkedIn. I was surprised I did that about two or three days ago for a position that we're now hiring. You get flooded with hundreds of applications. It's a little bit overwhelming as well. But the, the idea is that LinkedIn actually works and it's becoming a more and more important platform for hiring. Uh, there is one that I'm, I'm tracking and really like, which is called Dynamite Jobs. Um, great podcast as, as well, by the way, called Tropical MBA. Um, one more platform is Fiverr. Fiverr is exactly for what I told you before about spend those $50 and hire something on very something very defined and minimal. Fiverr is basically the gig economy. Basically, everyone is offering their project or their services. It used to be $5. I never used Fiverr, actually, because I don't like the idea so much of having such low engagement pre, uh, hirings, but it actually, uh, people, people who use it are enjoying it a lot. Uh, a little bit to the upper end of the expense would be uh, two sites. One is Toptal. Toptal is uh, a very interesting site that is actually uh, matching you with very high quality people. So unlike Upwork and Up stuff, uh, they have a very, very strong screening uh, um, uh, process. But over there, the fees are starting with about $80 an hour. So uh, in Upwork and Hubsoft, you can get someone for even five or six. So that's something to, to think about. Uh, AngelList is a good source if you have a startup, and especially if you have received some investment in your startup. AngelList is definitely a recommended source and becoming a very strong uh, workforce uh, directory for uh, startups that have raised capital. Um, I do recommend to consider Facebook groups as well as a play to, place to hire, for example, uh, remote jobs uh, and so on and so on. Although I have to say that Facebook, just like Facebook and Google, uh, they are more and more monetizing those avenues. So that, by the way, LinkedIn as well. So that means that if you really want massive traction, um, you would have to uh, boost your post or your job post with Facebook ads. Uh, other uh, other uh, source of hiring would be networking events. Yeah, you go, when there is no COVID, of course, uh, going to networking events and basically uh, uh, mingling and uh, letting people know um, about your um, about your the positions that you're looking for. Uh, another thing would be speaking engagements, just like this one, by the way, <laughs> to prove my point, because I practice what I teach, uh, Startup Link is now hiring a, a full-time writer and marketing person. Uh, so if you're interested in startup ecosystems, in research, in development, working with the public sector, uh, feel free to uh, let us know. Uh, you can send us your resume at elliotstartuplink.com. So this is exactly how speaking engagements are going to be helpful when you're hiring. And the reminder, once again, when are you hiring? Always. You're always be hiring. Um, and uh, one more thing to do is to basically use your own network uh, to recommend you someone. So you can go to your network of uh, employees. You can go to your network of friends and tell them, hey, I'm looking for someone to do marketing and writing. Can you recommend something? Uh, this is great because you have a validation from someone that tells you that they trust someone, which is amazing. Uh, if you have an email list, you probably want to use this one as well. So those are a few sources. And I see that we have a few questions, so maybe I can jump into them for a second. Um, yeah, so Patrick, about the um, uh, slides, um, I will try to see what I can do, but I will tell you that this is going to be on uh, YouTube, so you can actually view the slides later in your leisure in a video format with me explaining them. Um, Patrick is also asking what would be a good site for finding someone with highly specialized skills such as microbiologists. This one is a little bit tougher, I have to admit. I would try Upwork because Upwork has millions of freelancers. So probably you would find some keywords that uh, are relevant for specific uh, things as well. LinkedIn would also be a good, uh, good, uh, good way to go because most of the workforce is there. So try to type the, uh, the keyword on LinkedIn uh, and then you would see some of the people now have some kind of a banner open to work a green banner so you would see also who can you hire. So I would go on those because in niche things, you want to go on places that have the biggest based on of, uh, of, uh, of candidates. So that's, uh, 
That's the idea. Again, people, if you have any questions, please do like Patrick and uh, send them in the Q&A because I don't really track the chat. Excellent. So um, we talked a little bit about uh, where are the best places, according to my experience. By the way, this is no like if you would ask some other um, CEO what's their uh, list, you're going to see that their list is totally different. They would tell you, I hire on Reddit or I hire on indeed.com or monster.com or whatever, whatever those, uh, there are lots of sites out there about hiring that I don't really know. It's only names that I heard. But the idea is that each and every one of us has different systems of hiring. You also have to look, one of the things I'm doing, by the way, I'm because I've hired dozens of people so far, I'm actually, um, I have a list of the sources. Where did I hire those people? And then uh, how was the experience uh, in a way? And I actually color mark it. And, and then I find what are the things that work best for me. Um, so kind of like an interesting experiment in data analysis uh, at some capacity. Okay, um, let's talk about why should we use freelancing platforms to hire? Because once again, you can also hire your network and you can also hire people in the street and uh, um, um, just, you know, post a job ad in the magazine or whatever. But what, what are the advantages that the freelancing site have? So first of all, I do think that they have the biggest supply of global talent, although now this is being challenged by LinkedIn. It is becoming more and more a hiring platform. Um, those sites like Upwork and so on allow you to connect with a, a, a massive pool, let's say, of, uh, of uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, the, the, the experience is really uh, unmatched. Oh, sorry switch the slide and um, uh, but it allows you to connect to people that are, have massive talent in that can be hired in very very low cost and also have very interesting um, circumstances of life that can allow you to hire them for much lower than uh, their uh, let's say uh, net worth i'll give you an example let's say um if you have someone that would be working in San Francisco, but because they're, uh, they, they really like the nature, they would live in a small village in the USA. Uh, that by definition will create a situation that they can also charge you much less because um, uh, they, they can't be in the epicenter of innovation in a way. Another example would be um, uh, mothers for example, that of, of young children. So they can't continue being in the very uh, intense or they don't want to be in a very intense work environment and they want to spend most of the time with their children. Uh, you can get amazing quality of talent and um, uh, only by being open-minded to the idea of giving someone flexibility uh, of their location and their time as well. So that's, that's a reason why you can find uh, all, all many people with many life circumstances in those sites. Um, the freelancing sites also facilitate a, a few tools that will be helpful for you when you hire and also when you actually manage uh, uh, people. So some of those tools would be, um, for example, uh, tools to track hours. So you can be always on the spot of knowing exactly how many hours people have been uh, basically are billing you. Uh, you can also limit the hours that people are billing you also on those websites. Uh, I don't use it anymore, but basically when you're starting out, you definitely want to make sure that you're not in a situation that uh, uh, let's say uh, your project is going out of control. Um, uh, those, those sites are also facilitating in many, many cases, the actual payment. They don't do it from the uh, kindness of their heart, by the way. They're taking a commission. The commission can be as high as 20%, uh, usually around 10%. And um, the, 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 the other things that those uh, freelancing sites can do for you, especially if you're working on a fixed sum and not an hourly sum, is that they allow, they allow you to put those milestones and also in a scroll method to be in a situation that if you um, sign the deal, let's say for $2,000 on one project, the money would be put in a scroll and only when the milestones are achieved, then the money is released. And they also have a mechanism of litigation or some kind of like if there is an, in a, an agreement between you and uh, the freelancer or you're the freelancer and your employer. Uh, so there are a few advantages, especially when you're new uh, to use those mechanisms. And um, 
one of the things that I think is the most crucial in those sites is basically a review-based mechanism that gives you uh, the power. So in a way, when you hire people over there, um, uh, you can also uh, kind of like leave them a review. So they're not necessarily going to run away with your money, let's say, although you would be surprised most people really want to give good work. So, but if you're afraid, let's say, uh, this is a good thing that basically you can review their work uh, as well. But do know that they can also review you as an employer. And if people see a review of this employer is crazy, keeps on screaming at me, you're going to have a problem hiring uh, as well. Um, the, the reviews are actually important because those, uh, those uh, freelancing sites in many cases would have star reviews that will also let you understand the past experience of the clients uh, of this person. This is something that is very hard to do in real life. The only thing that you can do in real life is ask, ask for uh, references uh, and then call the previous bosses and so on. Very few people do it. I think it's good to do. I never did it, but uh, those freelancing sites actually allow you to see the experience of uh, clients with those people. Um, and yeah, I'll just say that anyone that is basically on those websites basically declared that their lifestyle is adapted as a, a remote worker. And this is important because many of the people that are were playing a little bit with the idea of remote work before 2020 uh, were actually um, broke down because exactly why you know why today uh, that if this thing is enforced on you, uh, you could feel very isolated. You can feel like this is not something that you want to do. You can even, uh, God forbid, miss your office and the, the coffee breaks with your friends. I know I did, and I thought that I, I didn't like my office, but I actually did. And so uh, some people are not built for that. And by going to the freelancing sites, you're basically um, approaching the people that are actually built exactly for that. So that's, uh, that's important. Let's see if we have uh, questions. Um, Yes, uh, Yoni is asking, how would you recommend to hire a competitive CTO with AWS uh, and full stack skills? This is a little bit of a problem, Yoni, because you're talking about um, not necessarily a remote worker or a freelancer, but by saying CTO, you kind of speak about a co-founder. So um, let's talk about this. If you have a lot of money, you can do that. And I would do that uh, usually uh, from those sites. Although if you want a full-time person, Freelancing sites are also not necessarily that good because people are going to work for a few clients in the same time. So uh, if you don't have the money, uh, you would have to actually meet people and try to figure out who can be the CTO. Uh, and that's, uh, that's uh, a lot of it has to do with massive networking and convincing people to join you. Um, but if it is with money, uh, then those freelancing sites are actually a good start, but be aware that most of them are going to be in a freelancing mindset. And that means that they're not going to be your CTO, they're going to be your mercenary. And there is a big difference here. So uh, I would even go on LinkedIn in case like that. Um, okay. So um, yeah, anonymous attendee is asking a, a good question for an anonymous attendee, how to deal with IP confidentiality remotely. Uh, there isn't that much you can do. And to be honest, even remotely or non-remotely, there still isn't that much that you can do. A lot of uh, hiring has to do with trusting people. Um, and if your intuition is wrong and you hire people that cannot be trusted, um, you would have a problem uh, because there is basically nothing that can defend you. But I will give you also the bad news. Not so much can defend you even if you hire people not remotely. Uh, just by having them in the office doesn't mean that when one day when they leave the office, they can't use the IP and so on. So over here, it's a matter of trust, culture, and also a good legal agreement. And one of the things that I would do is definitely always when you start hiring someone, have a template contract, a, a hiring agreement, because a clear agreement, good friendship, right? So that's, uh, that's kind of like uh, important to, to mention. Um, okay, we have Alexander asking about when you talk about IRS, do you mean freelancers, permanent positions, or both? I mean everything. <laughs> so basically, each one of us needs uh, different stuff. So for example, uh, some of us would say, you know what, I just need an expert for a fixed uh, project. And when the project is gone, the expert is gone. 
Uh, others would say, I need someone to be with me in fire and water in the full time and just fight, fight with the company uh, until we're successful. And others would say, you know what, I just need someone to work three hours a day. So it really depends on you. And I think that's the nice thing about remote uh, work. It basically allows you to have a mix of all those things uh, in one place. So no need for definitions, right? Uh, and you can actually change it as you go. And I will tell you uh, a little bit about my, my, my hiring uh, history is that before um, uh, I used to uh, hire usually only part-time people for two or three hours. And now we hire only full-time people because we kind of notice that the things that people can do for two or three hours, you can't really get their dedication, let's say on the long term, uh, or when things are getting very, very tough, uh, if they have 10 clients to juggle, it becomes very, very difficult. But of course, in the beginning, when you start something, you don't have the money. So you don't want to you don't want to pay someone full time. So um, everything has its own alternative uh, cost in a way that we should uh, remember uh, always. OK, uh, we have one more question. I don't have I don't mind doing uh, questions because I think some of the questions are going to uncover much more interesting things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, how do you track? So anonymous attendee is asking, how do you track the time needed for each task? You first of all, there are tools. So if you're in a position that you're just starting, I will tell you now that with my team, I don't care. Like they have time tracking tools. I never check them. I hope now no one is here from my team, but I never look at them because uh, honestly, a lot of what I do is based on trust. And I feel like that I don't want to track my team. Um, and I think it's also uh, not productive to do that on the long term. However, in the beginning, if you're just starting or if it's someone that is has expertise and is billing you a lot for each hour, you want to know how many hours they do because a project can go out of hand. Let's say if someone is charging you, I don't know, $80 an hour, uh, you definitely want to be updated on a, on a daily, if not a weekly basis about how many hours they did. And in order to do that, you need those tools like uh, I recommend in the, in the freelancing side, they have those tools built in, uh, or you can use solutions like Hubstuff to track hours or Toggle, but whatever you do, track the hours because uh, it's good. And I will tell you also that in many cases, the employees themselves will prefer to, for you to give them a time tracking tool because they would like to maintain their work-life balance as well. So those are a few, uh, few tips and so on. Uh, about a developer that uh, tells you that they always need more time and so on, a tough one because if you're not a developer you don't know and that means uh, our dear anonymous attendee that you have to trust your intuition and hire a person that you have chemistry and trust with because if not it would be just like going to uh, a mechanic shop and uh, and someone's going to tell you uh, yeah you your engine is dead and if it's not dead it doesn't matter because you can test it on your own again a lot of uh, a lot of things that have to do with the uh, uh, let's say the intuition and the trust, and you're going to have to develop um, those uh, those uh, abilities. Let me let me actually jump a little bit uh, more to um, to the slide, just so we. Uh, I was worried we will not reach the managing part, but we're basically not going to finish the <laughs> the hiring part as well. We'll continue a little bit above the the hour, and of course, everyone that needs to go will send the recording. So we talked a little bit about uh, uh, why the freelancing platforms can be uh, can be relevant. And now let's talk a little bit about what are the things that you can get done on those freelancing sites. Basically everything, SEO, software development, customer service, data entry. Basically there is nothing that you can't do there. And basically there is nothing that you can ha can't hire people remotely. This year actually proved that the vast majority of knowledge work uh, can be done remotely. So the answer is absolutely everything. There is nothing basically that can't be done remotely. Uh, if any of you are thinking if this economy is big enough, it's huge. In 2020, it's basically most of the economy. So this is a presentation I prepared way before 2020, I think 2013. Uh, over there, it was an issue of people actually saying, is this thing actually happening? Uh, in 2020, I think it's not even needed to, to discuss it. Um, uh, the process, by the way, of uh, how to work on those freelancing sites, if we're talking specifically about freelancing, is the following. You post a job, you uh, go through interviews and you hire someone, you track their time and you pay. So that's basically according to the process by uh, Upwork. 
Let's talk a little bit about the parameters to decide before you hire, because honestly, in many cases, we will blame other people for our bad hires, but I will tell you that um, the reason why your hire was not successful is you, and uh, it's because you did not take the time to understand what you need, because you just said, you know what, let's just hire. And uh, what I would encourage you to do is to do a few things before you hire, to make sure you have clarity yourself about what exactly are you doing. So uh, the first thing I would recommend is the following. Uh, do some thinking with yourself about what function exactly do you need to hire? Uh, you don't hire just to hire. Try to understand what exactly are you trying to hire and what is the outcome that you're expecting. And I recommend to write it on paper because you would be surprised that you're like, oh, I need a writer or whatever. But then again, for what? What are the tasks? Doing what? What would, what would be a great hire as a writer? So if you didn't do the work to figure it out with yourself, don't expect a freelancer uh, or a remote worker to arrive with telepathy skills and kind of like extract the information from your brain. It's not going to work. Take the time to prepare. Um, what, one thing that you have to decide is do you want a team member or an expert? So let's say if you have a project that you have to build a website and so on, and you know it's a one-time thing and it's basically done when it's done, you need an expert. If you need a writer or a marketer, a salesperson, you need a team member. So that's important to kind of like understand within yourself, uh, what exactly do I need? What, what is the, how do I define this person that I'm hiring? Of course, the budget is important. Uh, think about how much can you spend? Because if you don't know how much you can spend, um, you would run out in the middle. Uh, and that's not good because you want to plan ahead to give the project uh, the best success rates as possible. A few considerations, especially on the freelancing side, but not only. There are usually two ways that you can work with people. The first one would be a fixed price. Uh, and the second one would be hourly. In many cases, people mix them up and actually choose the wrong option between those two. So I will just tell you that a fixed price, let's say $1,000 for a project or 5,000 or whatever, is for every project that has a clear scope and a timeline. So if you have a clear scope and if you have a timeline, a fixed price is actually a relatively good option. Hourly, and I have to say that most of my projects are hourly because of my disorientation and confusion mode that I'm always at. Uh, this is mostly for ongoing and evolving projects. So um, again, if you're building a site, but you're not exactly sure how the site would look like, and you know that you're going to discover things about the site and new features that you want to add and so on, do not do a fixed project. Do an hourly because you want to allow the project to evolve. Uh, if you know exactly what is needed and you have a very, very decided budget that you know you can't go above, um, a fixed project would be better than an hourly. So it's a little bit complicated, but I'm hoping that would help you a little bit in those decisions. Um, deciding the milestones and the deadlines can be important. I never did it, but it's a good skill. Uh, that's important, especially for fixed contracts, when there is a fixed sum, and then you need to know when do you release the money according to which milestones. Um, one more thing that you have to think about that I think is very important, maybe not in the beginning, but later, uh, part-time or full-time. Uh, and the idea over here is that part-time is going to cost you a lot less because it's two or three hours a day. It's also good for some people that would not want to work full-time. Full-time is something that is more dedicated and it will uh, give you access to something that I think is very important called shower thoughts. So in a way, um, if I know that I'm working with a remote worker and they have two or three or five or 10 more clients, I know that some of their shower thoughts are going to be about the other clients, about, hey, we should do that or we should. And I prefer to be in a situation that uh, if I work with someone full time, I have their dedication and I have their creativity and the added value that arrives from them being um, only exclusively on a project. So again, this is another thing that you have to think about. Uh, usually in the beginning phase, you will take people on a part-time and then later transition uh, to full-time. Other things you want to think about when you hire is language level, um, both spoken and written, and also uh, time zone. 
time zone can be a massive killer, by the way. If you're hiring someone in Australia, you found the best person in Australia, and then you figure out that actually when you're awake, they're not awake, you have a massive problem. So I totally recommend always try to hire someone, although it's remote, from the same uh, horizontal uh, line of the globe. That would be uh, very helpful in general. Uh, do we have time for another slide? Yeah, I'll just say that in general, if um, uh, if you have uh, uh, if you know that the project is of very high budget and it can't go wrong, focus on experts that prove themselves. Focus on people that have reviews that you can't go wrong. You pay them the premium because they can shine and validate themselves with reviews or with track record or companies that they worked before with. If you have low budget, I love to take bets on the uh, gems that are unidentified. I like to think about myself as a gem that was un unidentified when I worked for $5. It's probably not the case, but uh, the idea is to find those people that don't know that they're super talented and they exist. And uh, you, can, you can run with them for a relatively extended period on a very uh, low hourly. I don't do that uh, anymore, I have to say, especially not now when I go on a full-time mode, but in the beginning, it was absolutely uh, crucial. I do want to always uh, communicate this. It's not uh, about getting the cheapest offer, but also uh, mostly about receiving the best value. So this is something that we uh, really have to, to think about. We will not have time for the other slides. I will just share with you two of the biggest lessons that I've learned about uh, hiring. Uh, and uh, if I only have to share two things, the first thing would be hire slow and fire fast. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go over uh, the process of how to hire slow, but I will tell you that when I hire someone, it's a very, very long process to be in a situation that we that I'm identifying the things that might not work out. Uh, the fire fast is also very important. Instead of making it painful for both sides, when you see there is no fit, fire fast. The second thing about hiring is that because there are so many candidates and so on, and you want to trust your intuition, uh, there is a saying, hell yes or no. So hell yes or no. When you meet someone and uh, they uh, tick all the boxes and you really feel like, okay, I should really hire this person, then hire this person. If it's kind of like, you know what, I'm not so sure or whatever, I recommend to delay and uh, basically evaluate more people. So uh, let's see if I can take a few uh, questions uh, uh, because we will not have time to go through with the slides and we're gonna do a follow-up to this. So stay tuned. Uh, thank you all for staying a little bit later. Um, Patrick is asking, how do you identify a gem without experience? Patrick, uh, intuition. You basically see someone, you speak with them, uh, you have an intelligent discussion, hopefully with a video turned on. Uh, you speak a little bit about things, you see the way that they think, you see their level of motivation, and uh, you go for it. And in, in many cases, uh, they would not be aware that they're so good. And in many cases, they would be aware that they're so good, but they need a really high quality leader uh, and a project that will validate them. So in the beginning, they know that a big company would not take a risk on them. That's why they go to work for you. You teach them things, you give them the stamp of validation that they have experience, they give you amazing value. So there is no clear way of doing that. But again, uh, they exist. And um, they exist in very, very big numbers. Um, Anonymous attendee is asking about the time tracking tool. The one that we're using is Hubstuff uh, for the reason that Hubstuff is sending a daily email at the end of each day, telling you how many hours were accumulated uh, across your, uh, your team. Andrew is asking, how do you maintain a network of freelancers that you don't use every day? Do you keep communication lines open? I don't like to having to look for people after I find uh, I need them. Um, usually, if that's a good thing about freelancers, the, it's a lifestyle. So for them, uh, they keep on fluctuate between uh, contracts and jobs. So in a way, I have a, I have a few freelancers that are doing freelance work for us for seven years now. And I just send them a quick email when I need something. And usually they say yes, because it's fun for them to work with us. They like the project and they have a little bit of slack, especially 
uh, Andrew, if it's not urgent task. So if you expect them to be kind of like on off, but then tell them, hey guys, I need this done until Friday, probably not. You also need to be a little bit relaxed, fun to work with, and also plan ahead. So uh, you give them the slack because they, they're not necessarily expecting an, an email from you uh, out of the blue. Uh, and I think the last question I'm going to take is from anonymous attendee asking what is the minimum number of hours you, you can and should hire someone to freelance? Depends, uh, just like anything else. So I would say that um, um, in some cases, like we mentioned before, you don't even want to work on hourly. You want to work on fixed projects when the project is very, very clear. But if you're working on hourly, um, take them for as much as you need them. So in a way, if the project is very intense and you need them to do sales and so on, and you want them to become a core part of your organization, maybe even full-time or at least two or three hours a day to maintain this connection and to make them feel like you're their biggest client. If it's something that is a little bit more, you know, task oriented and it can be like accounting and so on, then less. So there are no, no real answers over here. Great, I think that uh, unfortunately we ran out of time. There are other slides, but we uh, will not get to them. Why is it opening startup link? I don't know, but I'll go back to the slide and just tell you that if you have any other questions, elitestartuplink.com, I have to tell you, however, a disclaimer, I just do this for fun. Our work is basically on startup ecosystem mapping and promotion with government. So I'm not an expert on remote work, but you know, we like to stay in touch with our network in startup link. And it's always fun to speak with people that are building stuff. So I just encourage you to build stuff, continue building stuff. And if you can build it with other people as well, it's been very fun. And yeah, I just wish everyone happy holidays. Hopefully this was useful for you. And we'll try to do more of those. So this will not be the last time. And thank you again for arriving today. Thank you.